So welcome to this um, lecture. How Dr. Aiden found me and how I found him was that we're both really interested in the ways how the past is shaped continuously through contemporary symbolic efforts and how these and how that shapes our understanding of the past. And that's really what brought us together, that kind of <coughs> similar interest. So um, after the speech, then after about my, whatever, between 30 and 40 minutes of talking, there'll be questions. And I really hope that you guys have some questions because that would be great. So now that I've written two books on um, the messages communicating uh, about public memory at US in the US, one of the questions that I get repeatedly when I'm interviewed is what themes do I notice in commemorative practices? And honestly, this question always stumps me. Um, and and it, it normally comes right at the beginning of an interview. It's one of the first questions I get asked. And um, they, <clears throat> they want me to just lay it out. So this is supposed to be a softball question. It's supposed to be the opening question. And one of the things that I've learned through all of this research is that there is no, nothing that connects them. There is no overarching theoretical connection between these sites. And um, this makes the interviewer crazy. They, they don't like that answer. They thought this was going to be going in, in a particular direction in the interview. So they'll generally try the question again. And they'll come up with, there has to be something that connects our commemorative impulses. They'll try to come at it that way. And so I try to answer their question again by saying, um, in just a little bit more detail, that each of the sites that I've studied has their own sets of reasons why they came to be, their own uh, challenges and their own um, meanings that, and certain ones become dominant at the time of their construction that really very little connects to the next one. So th this is never the answer they want, and they're never satisfied with this answer, and once I start to say that, it's starting to get too academic for, um, for the interview. So here I am, 10 years in, two books, two books later, analyzing public memory, and um, they are convinced that there has to be something that connects all of these. So my first question for this discussion today is why? Why do I keep getting this question? Why is there so much pressure to have one theory about how public memory works, about how commemoration works? And I have, I have several guesses why I keep getting this question. And one has to do with the field of communication, and the second has to do with diversity. The first part's relatively straightforward to explain. The field of communication, we have a strong social science uh, element to the discipline, and it's comprised of researchers whose primary interests are identifying unifying theories of communication. The researchers have conducted important studies identifying a, a variety of human comp theories, from uses and gratification, spiral of silence, cultivation theory, agenda setting, media framing. For a communication scholar like myself, whose main interests are in culture and representation, investigating meaning is a very different endeavor. And that makes the second part of my response much, much more complicated. And in order to study large-scale commemoration and the meanings that are communicated at these locations, I, I need to ask a range of questions and that go beyond even just the histories of the particular sites that I decide to study and look at. I begin by questioning with who gets commemorated. Um, not all presidents have a, mall, have a commemoration on the National Mall. Which wars get commemorated? What other, events, what other events get commemoration? Who decides? Where does commemoration take place? Even with these few initial questions, I began, I began to understand in my research that there really isn't a unifying theory. And I found repeatedly that it's only through a really deep dive into each site that I can begin to figure out the politics at the time of each site's creation, and I can start to represent in my writing the oppositional meanings, the changing meanings, and most importantly, who's not included. And this is where context and diversity meet commemoration, and this is why it becomes so much more complicated. And that's what I want to do, talk about in this talk. 
and I'm going to tell you three different stories of sites that I did research on and how these, all, how these interacted and the kinds of challenges that came up in each site and why issues of diversity fueled so much contest, so much disagreements in their creation. And then I'll end with, by outlining some of the necessary challenges of including diversity in the commemorative landscape. So, first off, the thing that I hope, if you haven't paid attention, that the, one of the things I've certainly taken away from all of my research is that all commemoration is really hard. Nothing, not one single site I looked at <laughs> is easy. There are arguments about everything, and I mean everything, from um, location, building materials, architectural design, which plants to put in front or around a, a memorial, the funding, the interpretive materials, and even the dedication ceremonies are fought over. So that being said, these fights are really worth paying attention to, and that's really what draws me in when I, I'm doing my research, is looking at what, what are people arguing about? Because they really, these particular moments, they isolate and they crystallize the values of the particular time of their construction, and they give us insight into the national values and what we cherish today. So I found lots of folks to uh, help me develop my research, develop my methodology to figure out how to do these kinds of analyses and, and how to um, look productively at these different kinds of conflicts. And they include professors Carol Blair, Greg Dickinson, Brian Ott, and Barbara Biesecker. They all remind us that commemorative sites illustrate aspirational civic values. And I've also found uh, French theorist Jacques Rancière's concepts of consensus and distances uh, really helpful for my insearch, for my research. He defined consensus as this uh, vision of politics, this consensual vision of politics that always evolves attempt an attempt to define the preconditions and determine the political choice as objective and univocal. And since several of you have been in uh, classes with me, you know that I have all kinds of issues with the term objective, and what I really like about his insight into it is that the term is politicized. It depends on who gets to, to define what is objective. And his other idea about dissensus that I use a lot in my work is this um, idea, a logic of equality that reveals the arbitrariness of that distribution of political practice and artistic practice. So what's really nice about his insights here is that things, I love this idea of arbitrary that nothing is set in stone, that we don't already know what's of value, right? That we have to go through politics to figure it out. And that is what I saw happening over and over again at each of the different sites. Yet then to build on top of these concepts, I also uh, bring in the idea of the rhetorical theory of decorum. And our former professor, Dr. Paul Turpin, he defines decorum as the capacity to assess situations with appropriateness as the key criterion. The most important point here, is it appropriate? And is this behavior, what's going on, is it appropriate? And that's defined by the values at the time, right? So we have politics and values both coming into play that are being relied upon when we're figuring out how to commemorate, what to commemorate, what we're gonna remember. So, let's begin with the portrait monument. Have any of you seen the portrait monument in uh, the rotunda in the National Capitol? This will all be news to you then. This is um, this monument uh, that was built to commemorate um, the 19th Amendment, women's suffrage, just about every single element of this piece was fought over. Every, everything you can imagine. And one woman described it as she, this, this uh, monument had the most torturous path to prominence in the history of uh, congressional art. So let me explain this story. It's kind of, um, I always find it a, an amazing story how much fighting went over how to commemorate women, women getting the right to vote. These people are Lucretia Mott, Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton. The idea here is it was sculpted in 1920 
It was, um, the sculptor was Adelaide Johnson, and the idea was um, they saw the boat coming and it was going to be located in the Capitol Rotunda. That was the goal. And the National Women's Party paid to have it sculpted and brought over. There were uh, negotiations back and forth with the senators to get it into the Capitol. So the senator who's in charge of letting um, statues into the Capitol voted against suffrage. So let's look at all the things he did to try and stop commemorating women's suffrage in the Capitol first. So they bring, he, will, he just will not agree to it, period. And the Women's Party is going ahead and having it made and they're gonna bring it over and this is gonna happen. And he keeps stalling, stalling, stalling. So what they, find, what they finally do, what the sculptor does, is she brings it, this is eight tons of marble, and has it dropped at the steps of the Capitol. Eight tons of marble sitting right in front of the door, but nobody can get in, nobody can get out. And um, what, the, uh, what, ult what ultimately happens is that he um, relinquishes, he gives up the fight, and he finally says, um, all right, you can dedicate it here, and they get the dedication, but the next, the very next day, he has it moved to the basement, which is at this time in 1920 is the crypt of the White House because it was built. That's where they were going to put Washington, George Washington's ashes. So it was this very basement-like, crypt-like space that really um, nothing was down there. So people stored bicycles and just put stuff. And this is where the portrait monument ended up. So. Um, what, what I found amazing, and it sort of gives me pause when I see today's po uh, politics and what's going on in Washington, and I get a little frustrated about the um, lack of agreement, even over easy things, that, that this time in uh, US history. So these are the things that uh, Senator Brandegee Brand said when he tried to keep um, this portrait, this, the portrait monument out of the Capitol. He said that um, the Fine Arts Commission had to decide not, not the Senate, not actually him at that point, and that wasn't true. Then he said that the Congress, uh, that the Congress couldn't accept works of art during the break. This was during uh, winter break. That wasn't true. He said that um, only Congress could accept it, and that wasn't true. And so one after another after another, they all, every single objection he said got shot down. So. But that was just like one side of the arguments. So this is a senator doesn't want the does not want this in the um, in the rotunda or in the Capitol. Then we get another whole set of arguments from uh, within the women's movement at the time that um, they were splitting in different directions in terms of what should be going on, what kinds of political fights should, women should be fighting for, and there was. One side um, thought that um, they didn't want it in because it was ugly. They didn't like the way um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, which her daughter thought she looked too fat. The, um, another, another side didn't like the bottom, the unsculpted part. They thought it looked unfinished. And the, pers the sculptor, Adelaide Johnson, who put this thing together, purposely left it unsculpted. And the reason she did that is she didn't want it to look like just these three women were responsible for women getting the right to vote. It was a movement. And it came out of all, all women. And that's what the bottom part was supposed to represent. And these were the two, three that rose out at this particular time, but that the movement continues. So in many ways, it's kind of a radical port, kind of a radical monument when you think of it that way, because we really like to just make statues of one person and say, that person did it. But this is a very different idea for how to commemorate. And that ran into all kinds of resistance as well. And it was primarily, we get these kinds of, um, we get the critique in terms of aesthetics. When what I argue is that I think I have a lot to do with politics also at the time to keep it out. So it gets moved to the basement. There are resolutions passed in 1928, 1932, 1950 to move it back up into the rotunda, and they all fail, one after the other after the other. And um, I can show you the people. I shouldn't show you the people who were. This is the sculptor. 
and this is the group of women that were suffragists at the time that were supporting the monument coming, and this is what it looked like when it got delivered. So and this is what it looks like in the rotunda now. So in, when it finally looks like it has the votes in the early 90, 1990s to get moved back up into this, and this is actually is the rotunda where that picture is taken, um, then Senator Hillary Clinton and at least 20 other senators voted in um, to basically stop the uh, movement until Sojourner Truth could be added to the monument. See this piece back here? They wanted her head sculpted and added in. So the entire movement stopped. All the, everything stopped again to move it back up until it was resolved um, whether or not Sojourner Truth's likeness could be sculpted, added into that piece back there. So this, um, there was so much research done at this point on whether that stone could even uh, handle being sculpted into another likeness. And there was all kinds of opposition that came up to this, including artists who said you can't uh, deface another artist's work. This is not what they intended. Um, and they finally came up with a resolution. And if anyone's been to the Capitol recently, there's this emancipation hall where you get your tickets to go on tours, and there's all kinds of statues down there now. They added Sojourner Truth. And that was the compromise, that she would get added to um, Emancipation Hall as opposed to added, actually physically sculpted into this, this particular port the portrait monument. So this um, reading the story and seeing all the different levels of uh, and how difficult it was to just commemorate women's voting made me question um, about our assumptions about commemoration in general and how do we then, how do we commemorate women's contributions? And it really um, pointed out to me that we need to rethink um, the entire approach and how we're going to get more women into the commemorative landscape, given how hard what this one piece went through, just trying to get in. And it now is still in the um, Capitol Rotunda. And if you guys go, definitely take a look. So the next story I want to tell you about is the Lincoln Memorial. This is another really interesting example of how issues of diversity really complicated every single element of um, this monument's production and construction, its reception, and its use. So the initial issue, when uh, the idea came up to build this memorial in 1867, two years after his death, this is when we very first started talking about um, how to commemorate um, Lincoln, was would he be remembered as savior of the nation or um, as the great emancipator. That was immediately how the politics broke out in 1867. <clears throat> it was one or the other. And you guys know enough about the Civil War to understand sort of the implications of those. Those are two very different positions in terms of understanding the US uh, and our goals and our history and, and what we're about. So as um, what, so Henry Bacon was chosen as the architect, and what he really tried to do when he was putting this together was he tried to balance it. He tried to include all these different elements that would have a little bit of both. And what he did was above the uh, Gettysburg Address and the, his the second inaugural speech, there are these uh, murals by uh, Jules Berin, and that are, I don't know if you can see them very well, but they're illustrating um, these um, virtues of charity, patience, patriotism, devotion to high ideals, and humanness. Um, we have the quotes in the building itself. We have 48 states that, if you look closely on the outside, that are carved into the exterior attic walls, 36 columns representing the 36 states during the Civil War. And this quote right above uh, Lincoln's head there, it states, in this temple, as in the hearts of the people for whom he saved the nation, the memory of Abraham Lincoln is enshrined forever. Public memory scholar Kurt Savage, he argues that these two quotes from Gettysburg and the second inaugural address indicate Bacon's preference for Lincoln as the great emancipator and as the main message of the memorial, which overwhelms the savior of the 
nation message that's in the building's design and the murals and the quotes behind um, the statue. This message of Lincoln as the great emancipator is the one that did emerge, is the one that did start to how the memorial got to be read. And it really took hold in uh, 1939 and Marian Anderson uh, sang on the steps of the Memorial America. And if you guys know about this event, the Daughters of the American Revolution had invited her to sing at their Constitution Hall. This is 39, this is radio, they hadn't seen her when she stepped off the plane, when, when she got there, I'm not sure if she came by plane, um, they saw she was black and they wouldn't let her perform in Constitution Hall. Uh, Roosevelt presidency organized quickly, got her over to um, the Lincoln Memorial. So basically from 39 until 63, the memorial becomes the site of a series of African-American civil rights gatherings and it became the location where all kinds of folks, all kinds of constituencies would go to protest. And um, so we, sort of this appropriation of the Lincoln Memorial was um, really challenged in 2003. A group of high school students from Arizona went to the memorial and they were really disappointed that they didn't see anything at the memorial about Martin Luther King because that's how they learned about um, the Lincoln Memorial. So they got it to, they organized with the National Park Service, NPS, they raised money from Congress, and they added exhibits in the basement of the Lincoln Memorial, and they added an orientation film that explained um, the history and the use of the site, of the memorial itself. So in, and this, and this showed until, two, it got installed in, two, in, 1994 and in 2003, the um, Reverend Lou Sheldon and the Concerned Women of America demanded that the orientation film be removed. Now, what they had in the orientation film were pictures of all the protests that were there, and this is how it looks when you're in the memorial, that, that, the little blue, bluish piece there, of the uh, orientation film that's an eight minute film shows on a loop continuously throughout the day, and we get images of marches for civil rights, workers' rights, Russian Jews, farm workers, employee unions, women's rights, and gay rights. For the Reverend and for the concerned women, they wanted the last two out. This was, they, wanted, they did not want those references in the orientation film at the Lincoln Memorial. The news of this demand, and this was to, um, at this time it's George W. Bush, who's president, um, got leaked to several LGTBQ news outlets, the Washington Blade, Gay.com, and they're basically responsible for why this move to try and change and re-edit the film or change the film became a national controversy. And it did. It got national news, it got national coverage. And while I was doing my research at, um, on the Lincoln Memorial and trying to, my interest had been in terms of um, how all this interpretive material was, um, what kind of message do you get from the Lincoln Memorial, from all the interpretive material these days. I basically got shut out because of the law, a lawsuit got filed and a Freedom of Information Act was filed in order to get all the documents to see whether or not they were going to change the uh, footage, whether or not they were going to replace the film and what were they going to replace it with. For me, as a researcher, and for just about everybody else, that basically meant we couldn't go, we couldn't do research anymore, because nobody would talk to us. Uh, they basically been told, and I found all the emails that told all the M National Park Service, MPS personnel not to talk to researchers and not to talk to the press. So, I had to go work on another site and come back in a couple of years um, after it got settled. So what happened when it got settled, all of the um, documents got released and I worked with two different nonprofits to see the documentation that got released showing um, what they had, and I basically worked off the purchase orders and emails to see what kinds of things that they were buying and trying to do. One of the things, if I tell you all the things that they bought, the Freedom of Information Act only covers written materials. So I never got to see the film, which I think got made, but it, um, our Freedom of Information Act does not cover audiovisual materials. So 
what I found, and the other thing that was really interesting, so I had one set of um, documents and another set of documents, and this is about the Lincoln Memorial orientation film, okay? They were redacted. Just, it kind of surprised me, because I kind of thought until that point, redaction had to do with national security, but oh no. <laughs> But both sets were, um, all of the documents were redacted, and they were redacted differently. So as I was looking through this, when I was reading one set, I was like, oh, that part was marked out on the other part. So basically working between both sets, I could start to figure out um, kind of what happened. It was very, it was such odd research. So some of the things I found is they bought images from um, Reagan Mark's 176th anniversary of Lincoln's birth, Inauguration ceremonies get underway for Je George W. Bush. Um, rally in front of the Lincoln Memorial. Close up of signs, no more gun laws. Ban criminals, not guns. Pro-war rally, uh, one, two, three, and four. Um, Pro-life rally, one, two, three. March for life. George Bush Sr. walking down the Lincoln Memorial. And liberate Iraq sign. So the direction of the new film was pretty clear. This was, uh, the film was not going to go in the, dire the historical direction of how we thought about Lincoln and how everything else was organized, even in the exhibit, between savior of the nation or great emancipator. We were going in completely a new direction here. And this episode at the Lincoln Memorial is one way that just this one site is still problematic, it's still hard to figure out how we commemorate diversity um, from the beginning until the present moment. So that brings us to, oh, and one thing I should say is the film didn't change. They, um, it, they stopped and they left the, the original film in and it's still running. If you ever went to see it, just go to the basement, find, find the signs that send you to the bathrooms. That's how you'll find it it's actually kind of hard to find. <coughs> so that takes me to, so I showed you both, I wanted to talk about the Portrait Monument and the Lincoln Memorial because they're both, they ended up relatively positive results despite these really long challenges and these really long arguments. But they um, show how complicated it gets when you try to include diversity in commemoration. So I want to end this presentation on a discussion of the Rosie the Riveter Memorial in Richmond, California. This memorial that is right on the waterfront is part of the Rosie the Riveter World War II home front National Historical Park called Rory, which is from, it, from the beginning, from its inception, from all the original documents that I read, the idea was to address diversity and inclusivity in this, in this particular location. The, um, the difference is the diversity that they were really going after here was economic class, which is a very um, different approach to commemoration. And one of the reasons I found, I find this site so interesting, and you guys should all put it on your list of a place to go. It's really close, and it's beautiful, and as you can tell, the location is great. So the um, city of Richmond commissioned the construction of the Rosie the Riverter Memorial on one of Henry Kaiser's former shipyards. And during the initial planning stages, the National Park Service, they were looking around the country because they wanted to build a park to commemorate uh, the World War II home front and what was going on in the US um, on the state side during World War II. So what happened is that the NPS ended up working with the city of Richmond and the Rosie the River Riveter Memorial got incorporated into this larger park, into Rory. What, um, what I found really interesting at this, pub this site of public memory was that initially this memorial was only for women who worked on the home front, but as it developed, it included women and men and the actual work that they did during World War II. And this was a concern for some MPS personnel who were, they basically were sad that they were losing the exclusive focus on women because there aren't a ton of sites to women in the United States. And it was also, the other thing that was kind of unusual in reading the background, it was one of the few war sites, war memorials, sites of commemoration, where the men who were commemorated, it wasn't for their act in war. It wasn't for in combat. 
So, one result of incorporating the memorial into the NPS, into this um, homefront park, is that um, every time I've gone in to see it and everything that I've written about it, it really reads much more. It has a really interesting message. It's sort of moved in different directions. And it really comes, becomes a memorial to a lost working class. And we get that in many, many different ways at the site. The, um, one of the first ways it hits you if you go is its actual location in Richmond, California. And those of you who've been there, you know Richmond as a city has been decimated um, by the, um, the Great Recession, hasn't had the kind of recovery as the rest of the Bay Area has had, and is really in, still not benefiting from that economic boom. And it's also interesting because, a little hard to see this, because what they've done is they've um, reappropriated many buildings that were already there. But what you get, in addition to men and women working in World War II, is you get representation of African Americans, Japanese Americans, Italian Americans, and LGBTQ experiences. This site, from the beginning, intentionally embraced intersectionality as it moved away from only commemorating women's contributions. The visitor center and the interpretive signs explicitly focus on how racist the unions were to black rosies. There are exhibits that describe the tragedy of Japanese and, and Italian internment. And there's all, there are the daily kind of racism in housing and living in Richmond is illustrated in multiple displays throughout um, the, the visitor center. There were, even with this really explicit focus on intersectionality and diversity and economic class, there were still a couple of things that made me wonder. You know, this is like, this seems like we're going in the right direction, but one of the, um, there was no reference at all into how harshly the women were treated by men who were working on the home front in World War II. And this is, and in my research, I found multiple references to men in purposely dropping um, equipment and so that it would hit the people below, that would, would be the women below. And um, the women would feel physically threatened by um, all these by tools coming down. And mainly it would be retaliation for not being receptive to their sexual advances. Women, and if you resisted or if you talked back or if you complained, it, you would be given the dirty jobs, and one Rosie described a male co-worker who lunged at her and crammed her welding mask below her ears. And as I read about all these accounts, and the, there are quite a few of them in my research, I couldn't believe that I hadn't heard of any resistance to having women working in the home front factories. If anything, we heard exactly the opposite, certainly in popular memory. And, um, and there's even an exhibit in the visitor center it's called Danger on the Job. And during World War II, it, it outlines how dangerous this kind of work was, what they were doing. And one sign quotes a 1944 New York Times article stating that industrial casualties um, between Pearl Harbor and January 1st of this year totaled 37,000 killed, or 7,500 more than military did, and 210,000 permanently disabled and over four million te temporarily disabled. 60 times the number of military wounded are missing. Second issue that struck me at Rory was uh, found in the visitor center basement. And this is where there was a temporary exhibit entitled LGBTQ Histories from the World War II Homefront. And this exhibit in contained posters of Bev Hickok. She identified as lesbian. One of uh, Jeffrey Dykeman identified as transgender with narratives of their experiences during World War II. And they, there was um, several posters, and there was a sign recruiting for more stories. If you had anything to add, please contact the NPS and share your stories with them. As of 2017, there was no decision about how long this, this exhibit would remain in the visitor center. And and as I thought about it, at first I was really surprised and happy to see, oh, this is great, you know, we, we just don't see this in national park representation. And then the more I thought about it, the more I, I really I needed to take into account, this is a temporary display. 
This was by no means a permanent display, and there's no idea, I have no idea, nobody there had any idea how long it would stay. So, as I describe my analysis of Rory, I want to highlight one of the best aspects. I've pointed out a couple things that really bothered me. The things, this is when the Rosies, when they came to visit the site, is pretty impressive. Phyllis Gold and her sister, a World War II draftsman, observed that, quote, we never expect it to be recognized. And former welder uh, and Rosie, Jesse Santos, said that, quote, I never felt so proud in my life. At least I've done something for the Rosies of Richmond. And Mary Head, a 79-year-old Parchester Village resident and former welder at the Kaiser Shipyard, stated that, quote, this is the day that most of us as Rosies will never forget because it happened at a time when some of us could speak and see and tell the story. And I am blessed to be part of the memorial. And I never thought I would be, it would be remembered what we did. Additionally, Rory has the, the oldest full-time national park ranger in the United States, Betty Soskin. She's 98 years old. I'm not sure if you guys read in the paper that she's still working full-time there. And she recently had to take time off because she um, looks like she had a stroke. But she speaks when she's there, and I do hope she survives. She speaks about her time as uh, during World War II and the work that she did and her encounters with racism and misogyny while working on the home front. So to wrap up all of these stories, one of the main challenges in commemoration and diversity is, is really resisting universalizing depiction of women, people of color, working class, and LGBTQ people. And so you gotta resist universalizing as if it's all the same anywhere and incorporating the effects of race, economic class, and gender orientation into these representations. One of my initial motivations when I began my research for the commemoration of women in the United States was realizing that we were finally commemorating actual women. Uh, not, and not metaphorical women, like the Statue of Liberty or the Scales of Justice. The U.S. commemorative landscape is changing, and it's important to take note of it because it reveals so many assumptions concerning, concerning civic and national duty and patriotism. Another challenge with adding diversity is resisting celebratory commemoration while instantiating representation of the U.S. past negative chapters. This is the key to understanding why there's no one theory that connects how commemoration works. Each site has to engage more or less successfully with the politics of its time. Challenges remain for how we define commemoration and who gets commemorated. There is a move across the country to expand traditional definitions of commemoration, and I think this is an important development because of historic difficulties public memory sites have encountered with uh, diverse representation. All future forms of commemoration, all future forms of commemoration would be well served if they incorporated these issues into their representation. U.S. citizens deserve a commemorative landscape that recognizes their contributions no matter the form of the citizen's body, location, or economic status. Thank you. So now, do you have any questions? Um, where, where did your passion come from? Oh, that's, that's a good question. That's uh, one of the first questions I get. Um, is and, and I really had to think about it. How, how did I come up with this area of research? How, what really got me going? And I think it came from um, going to these sites as a kid, do it, being a his, historical tourist, you know, going to it and thinking um, it was important because my parents thought it was important, but then realizing I wasn't sure I agreed with what I was seeing. And um, then to see some protests in different places. And in, and in particular, one of the places that got me going was Mount Rushmore. And, and I had no idea, like, why were people protesting Mount Rushmore? I, I was a kid, I didn't understand. And so I looked into it a little bit more, and I found out, it's like, oh my goodness, there are multiple meanings of Mount Rushmore. <laughs> There's not just one particular meaning, because it's, it's 
literally carved in stone, and it just seemed like a given. And I just found that fascinating. <coughs> and um, it, it kind of built on that. That was sort of like an initial. And then when I got um, in a little older and into grad school, some friends were telling me about in Sacramento at the Railroad Museum. Have anybody been to the Railroad? Oh, yay! <laughs> the Railroad Museum that um, there had been all kinds of controversy over their orientation film. And I thought and that sort of brought up that old notion that I, I remembered as a kid. I'm like, well, wait, there are different ways that museums interpret. It's not just um, a given. And um, so I started to look into it and found out, and that's one of the chapters in my first book, is on the Railroad Museum and how all, all the problems that the first um, orientation film caused because, was, you guys know a little bit of your California history, who built the section in California after the Sierra Mountain, Sierra Nevada Mountain Range? Chinese. Yeah. It was all Chinese workers, right? And they were not in the film at all, not even mentioned. Uh, right. <laughs> and and this, this is uh, 1980. This is, yeah, I don't know. So uh, actually funds were raised and, and it was addressed. And, and then there's an exhibit that's got added, and uh, Chinese Americans are on their board of directors now. And it, and it just, it, it just kind of, it made me realize, and the more as I started to think about this as, as an adult now, was that these, these sites are malleable, and their messages change, and they should change, you know, as because there's all kinds of reasons they should change that more historical research is done. We have more information, and we keep finding out things that we didn't have before. And um, the folks who've been left out of our histories like the U.S. <laughs> they like the, they came. Their families came here. They wanted to be here, and they want to be associated positively with um, U.S. history. So all kinds of things are, um, were changing, and I just found that fascinating to see how these various sites around the country, how they were dealing with that, how they were trying to bring in um, other stories and, and not just tell one dominant story. As you are doing your research, how do you narrow down the scope? Because I'm sure you could fill books and books on what's happening in museums. So how do you pick which sites you want to talk about? Uh, that is a great question. So for my first book on exhibiting patriotism, I picked the sites, and this is when I, I was really focusing on the orientation films, because my background's in documentary film, and where there had been controversy, where there had been fights. And almost in almost every single site, the fight was over the film, which was really interesting. And that helped me narrow down what I was looking at and to find out what the fight was about at the USS Arizona. The, the fight was how they depicted the Japanese, and um, every and the Alamo, Tano's are missing, and, and we have, and so that narrowed my field very quickly. For and um, sort of unfortunately, for the second book on the U.S. commemoration of women, there aren't many commemorative sites. That <laughs> so it, it got narrowed. My um, my choices for artifacts got narrowed fairly quickly because I wanted to put something at na on a national level that had some sort of federal funding that would. Um, uh, it, Basically, I was trying to look at that level, and there just aren't that many yet. I know it was really surprised, and that really, and that just, and even realizing how few memorials to women there are, I hadn't even thought about that until I was doing my work on my first book. And as as you go through, one of the things that you do for research, what I do for research, is I go to the National Archives, go to the Library of Congress, and as I'm pulling files and looking through things, I was like, oh. Hillary Clinton did something? What did she do? It, not at all what I was looking at. And I would see these things, and then one thing led to another. I was talking to some other friends, and um, we realized this book needs to be written. And, and the, on, the ongoing joke was that it would be a very slim volume. Yes, uh, so you, uh, clearly, uh, it's, like what you said, it's very hard to uh, narrow down, like who made the decision. So it's, it looks like it's very kind of uh, controversial, uh, controversial in many kind of situations. And uh, 
But overall speaking, who make that final decision in that commemoration and here and there? Even that depends on the site. Right? So some of the sites, like the, when the USS Arizona folks organized to change the film there, that was a real bottom-up response from people in Hawaii and um, uh, Japanese American, JACL, um, you know, demanding change. That's one way it can happen. At Mount Rushmore, there was um, the Lakota in the area wanted uh, to be involved, but there was no there was no organizing it. The, the only way their voices got any representation there was because um, the MPS hired the superintendent was Lakota at one point, and so he brought in um, this um, heritage village, which would how. Um, Native folks would have lived at the time, and he added, um, when you do headsets, when you go places, yeah, you do headsets, it's so much fun. Always do headsets, <laughs> I think they're great. They, and you can get different languages, you can get whatever language you want to hear. Well, uh, he brought in Lakota, but it was very top down. It was not a bottom up kind of move. So even that, and so I was trying to think about, I, I even thought about that, it's like, was it, were these, did it take community organization? You know, did it take national organization for things to change? And, and every single place was extremely different. The, the funding for the, um, the National Women's Historic Park in Seneca Falls, it, Alan Alda came in and brought funding and helped um, make some things happen. So they have stars, they bring in stars. They, it, it, you just never know. Is kind of what it's going to take for it to happen. The Rosie the Riveter site is one of the few sites where the MPS doesn't own the land; they just rent it. So they and so they keep coming up with different ways to do commemoration, so that the and what's really popular now that didn't used to be popular is in terms of the design of uh, commemoration is holding contests and having people submit drawings, and then it's this real public event. And that, that seemed, that's kind of what happened with the trade towers in New York, but then it didn't, and they just picked a star to do it. So it's, you, you, you never know. It, and it, just, it, really, um, it just depends on the particular site and, and what's going on at the time at the particular site and if they're able to get federal funding or not, and what form it comes in, and what's being commemorated. Which, which is, is endlessly surprising. You know, you go and, and, you, and you look at it, and one of the things I found going down uh, the mall in DC is only 6% of the um, commemoration was of women. And that's not very much. You look at historically what's been going on. I was just thinking, Tommy, about your question at the Alamo. Mm -hmm. when, um, so the big fight there was how to get uh, Tejanos, who were Mexicans living in Texas, who fought on the side of Texas you know, for, uh, to be free from Mexico, into representation on site of the Alamo, because there had, there had been none, 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 none. And the, the group that organized the Alamo for years and years, actually since its inception in 1902, until um, 2007 was the Daughters of the Republic of Texas, the DRT. And they, to say that they were resistant to change is such an understatement. This, you know, this is basically the Alamo is gonna be remembered only in terms of that six day fight, period. It's, there's gonna be no contextualization, no uh, larger histories, no what was going on in the US at the time, what was going on in Mexico at the time. Nothing about, and the big issue about slavery, that slavery had been, had been a revolution in Mexico, slavery had been outlawed, um, but they wanted slavery at the Alamo in Texas, and so that was a big point of contention between the two. None of, no, nothing was going to be included until in 2007, there was um, basically, in term, they were trying to do some maintenance, and um, part of the ceiling fell on some visitors. And it, it was a scandal. This is a really terrible thing to happen. This is a, like three million visitors a year. It's a really popular site. And one thing led to another. All the history of the um, T 
tension between the daughters and uh, Mexican American community in uh, San Antonio came to a head and it was removed from them. And now it's run by the Land Commission, the Texas Land Commission. So these, who makes these decisions keeps changing too. As uh, um, I, I guess that was more in response to your question that um, you, I, I think it's easy to jump on the bandwagon and say the daughters were, were very, very conservative. They were also just not well prepared organizationally <clears throat> to respond to current contemporary issues and to changes. They just didn't, they didn't have that kind of flexibility in the structure, in the organizational structure. So I don't want to be like one of the oldest women's organization in the United States to say they were terrible, but they just, they, they weren't ready um, to respond in, in a timely fashion at all to some of the changes that needed to happen in interpretation on the site. Any other questions? Well, thank you all very much for coming.